thank you very much for being here tonight and welcome. Um, we have 24 sleeps to go until the referendum and, um, and I'm very excited to be here for this discussion tonight. Now you may be able to tell by looking at the panel that we've had a few uh, late scratchings and changes in, in the lineup. And it's turned into something of a family affair with the addition of, of our friend Noel from the other side of the country. So um, I'd like to uh, give my thoughts to Colleen Hayward, who was joining us today but actually had a fall this afternoon. Um, so we send her our best wishes. Um, and I gave uh, Uncle Fred the very late um, call up. And as he's pointed out, he hasn't had time to write a short speech, so we might get a long one instead. <laughs> um, so welcome to everyone here tonight. Uh, if you have come here with an intention already to vote yes, I hope that you find some inspiring material in what we hear tonight. If you've come undecided, thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you for your open mind and your serious consideration of this important issue. If you've come uh, with the intention of voting no, thank you for being willing to come and listen anyway and respect that others are here to listen too. The format tonight, we will have a welcomed country uh, from Simon Forrest, who, who's um, very generously volunteered to do that for us. Um, we will hear the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We'll hear from Ken um, Wyatt on the parliamentary input that has happened to this point, from Ben on why government needs advice on this issue and, and to give us a state perspective, uh, from Fred Cheney on closing the gap and how this will uh, help close the gap, and Noel on the spe specifics of, of the provision in the Constitution. Um, I will then moderate the Q&A session so now I'd like to hand over and invite up onto stage um, Wajak Noongar Elder and Emeritus Professor Simon Forrest. Now Simon um, has connections to Baladong, Wajak, Batamaya and Wongatha country here in Western Australia. And he comes to us with a long history in education, public service and Indigenous affairs. And he's volunteered his support for this event tonight by generously offering to welcome us to his country. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver this welcome to country. Gaia, Gaia Wanju, Nan Quell, Simon Forrest, Borongo. So Mawajak Baladong Noongar with King Connections, as you've heard, King Connections to Yemaji and Wongatha peoples. Kaiwanju Nija Wajak Noongar Buja. Hello and welcome to this place, the land of the Wajak Noongar on the Swan Coastal Plain and beyond Karamunda or the Black Hills to the east. Nanak Noongar Barangar Wadang Manat. We are the people of the crow and the white cockatoo. As an Aboriginal Australian, as a first Australian, I embrace the cultural diversity of our nation and in particular especially welcome people that have come to this country as refugees. I also want to make a special welcome to our visitors from a, a no place far away in Australia that you can get from here in Cape York to Richie Ahmed. Welcome brother. Uh, Wutherjee man and also to Noel Pearson. Welcome brother. Uh, yeah. Kuka Ladanji man. I am of this land and place. I was born to this land. I follow a bloodline of people who have lived, walked and cared for this land we know as Wajak Noongar Budja for over a thousand generations or 40,000 years. And our culture and knowledge of this landscape continue today even after the interruptions of the last 194 years. I've been to many international conferences with First Nations people from around the world. And they refer to us, other First Nations people from around the world, refer to Aboriginal Australians as the first of the first peoples, the firstborn of all peoples, the oldest continuing culture and knowledge system on this planet. All of us here present 
and beyond this place we are here due to what has happened in the past. We are a consequence of what has gone before us. For all to know and understand the historical truths of our shared history is important for all of us to know and understand in contemporary modern Australia. All of this will impact in one of the most significant days of our nation's history on October 14. There is a real opportunity for each and every one of us here and elsewhere over this vast country to change the course of our nation's history. Through the Uluru Statement from the Heart, First Nations people have asked all Australians to grant us a voice in the National Parliament enshrined in the Constitution. The final sentence of the Uluru Statement says, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. A gracious, compassionate request to our fellow Australians, not only a better future for First Nations people, but for all Australians. While you might be writing yes or no on the ballot paper, I put to you before writing your response to this constitutional amendment, I ask you to consider a values proposition as well. Is it the right or wrong thing to do to give First Nations people of this country a voice? Kaya is a Noongar word for hello, as most of you know. But kaya is also a word for the affirmative or yes. I'm not suggesting you write kaya on your ballot paper. <laughs> Yokai is a word as a shout out for victory. And I say to you now, Gaia Yokai. Gaia, Gaia Wanju, Nan Kuel Simon Forest Burungu. Gaia Wanju, Nidja Wajak Nunga Buja, Nunga Buja. Wajak Nunga Buja, Nyan Buja. Nal karich nunga mot ken kadat ni jabuda nan karich nunga kabali boron korie and kai yakai budawan and thank you thank you very much simon for that beautiful welcome um, and I acknowledge the traditional elders who are here from th these lands and, and across Australia and pay my respects to you. And we wanted to start the evening with the words of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Now this is where the voice referendum has come from. We'll hear more about it from our speakers later, but now you just need to know that these were the words that were agreed by 250 First Nations people from all over the country in 2017. This is the invitation to which we'll be responding on the 14th of October. Now Simon Forrest will read the statement, supported by Richie Armat, an elder from the other side of Australia in Cape York. Richie, do you want to come up too? Uh, and while we're listening to these words, I just want you to remember that um, given the politicisation of this issue, it's a heavy burden uh, to, to read these words and, and I want you to think about the generosity of, of this invitation and our response to it. All a statement from the heart. <clears throat> we gathered at the 2017 National constitutional convention coming from all points of the southern sky make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law, from time immemorial, and according to science, more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land, or Mother Nature, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto, 
and must one day return thither to be reunited with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possess the land for 60 millennia and that sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reform to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Madaraka, Madarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you, to walk with us in a movement of, Austra of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you very much, Simon and Richie. They make it seem so simple, don't they? Um, our first speaker is the Honourable Ken Wyatt, AM. Ken was the first Aboriginal person to be elected to the National House of Representatives 13 years ago and the first to hold a cabinet position with the responsibility for Indigenous Australians from 2019 to 2022. Ken resigned from the Liberal Party earlier this year over the Liberal Party's position on The Voice. Ken in this is notable for his principles. It's easy to stick to your principles when those around you are doing the same. It's much harder when it actually costs you something. And tonight, Ken will bring a former Liberal perspective on why The Voice is good for the country and the input that has been had from different sides of the political spectrum up to this date. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Simon, for the welcome. To my peers, thank you for being here. But to all of you, thank you for being here. The journey began with John Howard in the 90s with a referendum for recognition in the Constitution. But that preamble was written by a poet, not consulted on, and it failed. The second phase was when Julia Gillard took over leadership from Kevin Rudd and she committed to constitutional recognition and appointed 
two eminent Australians to co-chair the expert panel, Noel Pearson, who's with us tonight, and Mark Liebler. We consulted right across this nation. And the simple message that was heard time and time again, when will we be listened to? When will the messages of our needs be listened to by governments? Not by the bureaucracies, not by the NGOs, but by the people elected. And that report, when we compiled it, contained all of the information that was provided to us, even a chapter, not a chapter on sovereignty. And it was a true reflection of the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That report was handed to government, it was tabled, and a joint select committee, of which I was co-chair with Trish Crossing from the Northern Territory, was established. And we focused on the recommendations and what was pragmatic, what was acceptable to government, but more importantly, about how Indigenous Australians would be heard and had their feet under the tables when discussions about them occurred. To be there in co-planning, co-designing. That committee never finished its work because Parliament was prorogued and that committee fell away. And then I was at a Liberal Party state meeting and I had somebody come up to me and say, congratulations, I believe you're co-chairing the Joint Select Committee on constitutional recognition. And I said, I haven't seen it and I don't know about it. And sure enough, it had been written on page six of the Australian that I was co-chairing. So I had a discussion with the Prime Minister who said, I want recognition delivered in the term of my government. And later he went on to say, I will sweat blood to make this happen. And I asked Tony at the time, are we serious about delivering this? And he said, absolutely. I want you to think about sitting on the back veranda with your grandchildren talking to you and you saying, I help achieve that. But as I've seen, that is not the stance that Tony took then. That committee tabled its report in both the Senate and in the House of Representatives with recommendations about constitutional recognition and a voice, a structure that would give avenues for Aboriginal people to have a say on their destiny and their aspirations. They weren't happy with that report, so they commissioned uh, the, uh, the Referendum Council, and Noel was involved with that one. And their work was comprehensive. And when it came back to us, and I still visualise the day that we were sitting in the anteroom and we went into the meeting, and it wasn't Tony this time, it was Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister. And the Uluru statement was handed over to government. And there was this stunned silence. And the voice of the Prime Minister of the day said, this is not what we asked for. It was a report. And Mark Liebler jumped in at that point and said, this is what Aboriginal people, through a series of conventions, have asked for. They want to walk in partnership with Australians. They want to have a role in determining their future. And then said, we need the truth of this nation to be told. And Barnaby Joyce uttered the words, third chamber. And that third chamber stuck. But as we left that meeting, you could see the impact on all those who'd worked extremely hard to bring forward a statement that was a gift to this country to take a way forward that would make an incredible difference. And then Noel had a discussion with Malcolm asking why and what can be 
considered in the context of that. I then uh, was given a ministerial appointment so I couldn't serve on the next joint select committee. If I had, then I would have probably had a record for dealing with the same subject, subject over 12 years. But Julie and Lisa and Senator Patrick Dodson co-chaired that. And what they came back with was a recommendation for a voice to Parliament. Because Julian had spoken to me at length about local governments and how they worked and the influence they had on state and national governments. Because they had local governments, they had the state body, and they had ALGA, which was the national body, who could all and did approach ministers of the Crown and the executive at any time on any issue. So I gave uh, endorsement to the concept and Patrick and Julian completed their report, tabled it, and it was there. The point I want to make with all those reports is every federal member of parliament had access to those points and uh, to the reports and the points made within them. So nobody should be able to say they don't know the detail. If you are elected and you have a responsibility to read. In my charter letter, there was a sentence that the Prime Minister gives you as part of what he wants you to deliver. Because ministers don't do things on their own accord, you do it in accord with the policies of the party, the direction of the Prime Minister and your cabinet colleagues. But one sentence in there said that I was to bring forward at the, in the term of this government recognition and a voice. And every document and briefing that I did had the same set of words. If you look at the budget papers, money was set aside for each of those initiatives. But it didn't surprise me when we had dinner at the lodge one night and there were certain people around the table and I wasn't surprised. And the PM said, I just want to sound out from you what you think of the voice. And he went around the table and he left me to last. And having listened to the views, and I had a couple of strong supporters but the rest were casting doubt, I said, PM, if we're not going to legislate, because I always wanted to legislate for a local voice and a regional voice, and then stand up the national voice 18 months later, because I wanted the base fixed. And that's why I commissioned Tom Calmer, by the way, and Marcia Langton to do the work they did in the langton Calmer report. But that night the PM looked at me and said, I don't think we can go forward. My comment to him was, PM, <coughs> I want you to think about this. If we lose government, and I said to him, I think we will. I said, let me say to you, Labor will proceed with this, and whatever model they put into place, you're going to have to live with. You can either be proactive, or we can say no. A week later, he said no, publicly, he said there would be no voice. And that was the end of the, the work. And it didn't surprise me when there was that strong stance of no. But every initiative that we ever did, and in all of my life, all we've done is said to governments, we want to be heard. We want a seat at the table and we want to be recognised as equal partners in shaping our destiny, not just for us, but for our children and our grandchildren. And so the political journey could have been something great. We could have had, and I believe that if Josh Frydenberg was there, he would not have opposed a bipartisan support. He would have said, we will let this run. But let me say, I'm not giving up, nor are those that I walk with, because I believe 
in the voices of our people and their voices changing their destiny at the community and regional level so that they have the same quality of life as any other Australian who's been given an opportunity to have a future and to fulfil their aspirations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, heartfelt words. Um, our next speaker is Ken's second cousin, Ben Wyatt, from the other side of the political spectrum. Um, ben and I studied law together 30 years ago, and since then he's carved a path in West Australian politics <coughs> and, and was our first Aboriginal treasurer as part of a 15-year parliamentary career. And he now sits on a, a number of boards. Now, he brings some pragmatism to this discussion. He has a, a deep and personal understanding of why governments need advice and, um, and what we've tried in the past. So I, I welcome Ben to give his state perspective. Good evening, everybody. Uh, can I particularly welcome Noel and Richie all the way from Queensland this evening? Uh, can I thank you, Ken, as is always the way I've found uh, Ken has taken most of my time, um, but I'll endeavour I'll endeavor to make it up with hopefully a um, pithy speech. State government, the reality is that state governments are the governments that have the main contact point with Aboriginal people when it comes to policy development and policy implementation. The Uluru Statement from the Heart talks about various policy failures and they are all the purview of state governments. So why is it that state governments, all of them, in one form or another, have implemented some form of a voice? All of them. Because ultimately the challenge for governments when it comes to developing policies, who is it, who do you speak to? When I came to government as a Treasurer and Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, we had in Western Australia a well-developed native title system. Uh, in fact, the two states, Queensland and Western Australia, are really the two native title states, which gives you a capacity to speak to a recognised, credible Aboriginal group when it comes to developing policy. But ultimately, even that, when it came to broader statewide policy, you needed a much larger input. And so we actually called upon a very old piece of legislation in Western Australia, the Aboriginal Affairs Planning Authority Act, Section 18 of that Act, which establishes the Aboriginal Advisory Council. This has been in existence in one form or another since 1972, and the Aboriginal Advisory Council in Section 18 of that Act specifically states there must be a council, it must be made up of Aboriginal people, and it is appointed by the Minister to advise the government of the day. Now, of course, the great weakness in that particular body is the appointment process by the minister, uh, and there's no other. It's up to the government of the day what that looks like. Indeed, over the years, that's ranged from, uh, while I was uh, minister, representatives, male and female, from the two from the different regions of Western Australia. Over the years, uh, it's been pretty moribund, uh, being uh, an individual in government uh, through to a, a proper uh, council uh, of advisers. But regardless of how good the people are on that, its authority always suffers from the fact that there isn't actually a broader um, Aboriginal input into who sits on uh, that council uh, and who provides the advice to government, that, adv that voice to government. I want to make this point. Even though that legislation specifically says that that council will advise the government on issues in respect of Aboriginal policy. It's been in place since 1972. Not once has that, that section been used to challenge a decision of government. So this whole idea that the voice may well become a, a vehicle of litigation when its role is simply to advise the best place to look is actually here. Uh, we've lived with this since before I was born and at not one point has that been the case. Aboriginal people have always worn the responsibility of failure. And as you develop policy, there's no other area where there is an expectation as you develop it and you fund it and you roll it out 
that, there is, that it is likely to fail in its, in its delivery. That is why the closing the gap targets were reset in 2020 with a specific purpose to partner with Aboriginal Australia. Uh, in Western Australia, we've used that and the vehicle through the Aboriginal Advisory Council to get out best, really good outcomes in terms of the Aboriginal um, procurement policy, uh, which but for the Aboriginal Advisory Council would not have succeeded. And that has seen hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in state government procurement contracts go to Aboriginal-owned businesses. That was developed in partnership with the Aboriginal Advisory Council. And perhaps a very high profile example of where the council itself has delivered um, outcomes for the state is the state response to COVID. Now you may look that movement of Aboriginal people back to remote communities uh, to places of safety uh, away from uh, the spreading virus was the biggest movement of Aboriginal people in Western Australia uh, since they came off the missions and came out, came off the stations into the missions. There is no way a state government could have done that without the express uh, input, support, advice of the Aboriginal Advisory Council. Can you imagine? And that is why you have seen uh, health outcomes for Aboriginal Australians and certainly Aboriginal Western Australians uh, far superior uh, to the broader community. The final point I'll leave you with, I guess, is in respect of the example that we see around um, the town of Roburn. That is always, it seems, about every three or four years rolled out in the media is the example of government failure. Aboriginal people are always wear the consequence of failed policy, but don't have the capacity to influence the policy development. If Aboriginal people are going to have that opportunity, if they're going to wear the responsibility, well, give us the opportunity to be involved. Give Aboriginal people the chance to... <laughs> ..to simply seek advice on how policy should be developed and implemented, and you will always get... I mean, you don't need it. You don't know me to tell you this, but ultimately if you speak to the people on which you are trying to get a policy outcome, you always get, um, uh, you always get that better outcome. And that is why I always pose that question, is anyone in this room satisfied with the outcomes that this nation has achieved over the last 40, 50 years with the amount of money we've spent in Aboriginal policy? And that is one thing I can always get a consensus on. Whether you are a committed yes voter, an undecided voter, or a committed no voter, everybody will agree with that point. So if you accept that, then you have to accept that we have to do something differently. And the best way to do that is to involve Aboriginal people. And this is not, there is no neutral position on this. You vote yes, you are voting to say we can no longer accept the failure of Aboriginal policy development and implementation in Australia. If you vote no, that is not a neutral position. You are endorsing a status quo that has failed and you are endorsing the further uh, misuse uh, and bad spend of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. For me, the choice is obvious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, next up, we have Fred Cheney, who, apart from being my uncle, um, was also a, a former Liberal senator and MP, um, long career in politics, and including as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. And since then, he's been on the Native, uh, National Native Title Tribunal. He's been co-chair of Reconciliation Australia. And he's really um, committed a large proportion of his life to addressing Aboriginal disadvantage in the country. Thank you, Fred. At least it's clear I'm not Colleen Hayward. Um, look, it's a great privilege to appear on this platform. I'm sorry that Colleen's fall is why I'm here, but um, I do want to pay tribute to my fellow panellists, all of whom I know well and admire for their work for Australia and for the Aboriginal people. Thank you very much. The um, ability to make a short speech at short notice is not mine, actually, so... Fasten your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I just want to make a couple of points, though. Um, one is that this has turned into a campaign which is full of sound and fury and an awful lot of politics. So I want to refer you to a couple of documents which 
uh, outside politics, and which I think support my personal view that a voice to parliament is absolutely essential if we are to do better in the future than we've done in the past. The first of these is the closing a gap agreement, which has already been referred to by Ben, entered into by, in the year 2020, by every government in Australia. And it's worth going to the web and having a look at it and having a read of it because it's been signed by a Liberal Prime Minister, three Liberal Premiers, three Labor Premiers and two Labor Chief Ministers. And it's what politicians actually sign up to when they're not fighting a political campaign aimed at bloodying the nose of the Prime Minister. It's what they say when they're trying to deal honestly with the issues they have to deal with. And that agreement, I don't have time to refer to it because I left my notes at home, thanks to the late notice, <laughs> but the, it contains, as Ben has said, a commitment by all governments to work in future in partnership with Aboriginal people. How can you be in partnership with people you can't hear? It, it can... <laughs> the other really interesting thing in the agreement is that it talks about the incapacity of government, the failure of government as the reason for our failures in the past. And another Liberal minister, Josh Frydenberg, then the Treasurer, referred that agreement to the Productivity Commission. That's the second document I'd like you to have a look at if you're a doubter. The Productivity Commission was asked to report on the Closing the Gap Agreement. And that report came down, a preliminary report came down just in the last month or so, available again on the web. And what that report says, well, governments are not doing what they're supposed to do under the agreement. It's not because they don't want to, it's because it's very hard for governments to act as partners. They don't know how to be partners, they know how to be bosses. And so governments structurally need to completely change the way they work. And the point of that Productivity Commission report is that it's all very well to get the governments of Australia to sign up to being partners with the Aboriginal people as the only way that they'll be effective but we're reminded that they find it very hard to do that. And one of the reasons I support this constitutional recognition of a voice is because we need in the Constitution a constant reminder to governments to stop behaving the way they've behaved for the last 100 years. They've got to behave differently. And so we're putting that simple message into the Constitution. Now, the last thing I want to say is this. Why should we be recognising Aboriginal people in the Constitution? Well, because in 1900 our Constitution did refer to Aboriginal people. It excluded them. All of the provisions were essentially exclusionary. And why would we have done that? Well, think of our second Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin. Alfred Deakin did more than any other early politician to shape the way Australia was governed for the next 60 or so years. And Alfred Deakin said this, in 100 years, Australia will be a white country with not a trace of brown. The Aboriginal people of the South and East have died out. And in the West and North, they're dying out even where most gently treated. That's that's what set the tone for Australia, and that explains why the Aboriginal people were excluded. Now the Aboriginal people, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are part of the legal, social and economic fabric of this country. Here in Western Australia, as our previous governor would say, we are the native title state. We know better than anyone else how deeply embedded the oldest living cultures in the world are here in our home state. Surely that should be recognised in the Constitution. They should be included, not excluded. He doesn't need any notice, does he? Um, thank you, Fred. 
Um, and I'd like to now welcome Noel Pearson, our final speaker. Now, Noel comes from the Gugu Yimitha community of Hope Vale, and I believe he is one of the country's great thinkers. I first met him 20 years ago in Cape York, and he taught me a lot at that time. Um, he is notable for his vision. He was involved in negotiating the Native Title Act back in 1993 at the ripe age of 28. Um, he's always been capable of seeing that a better way was possible and articulating it. He's also notable for his resilience. He carries a huge weight on his shoulders and has spent his life straddling two worlds. He's worked tirelessly in partnership with Conservatives over decades, focusing on the right of First Nations people to take responsibility. So tonight he will be giving us his perspective uh, on The Voice in terms of the specific provision. Thanks, Noel. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the welcome from the Noongar people, and I bring greetings from Cape York Peninsula. I'm so very pleased to be here with my old intern of 20 years ago, <laughs> Kate. We were working on a program that we came to call Bush Owner Builder helping families build their own homes on their homelands. Bob the Builder, we call it now. <laughs> I'm very pleased to, to be here with um, Ken and Fred, my colleagues on the original 2011 expert panel established by Julia Gillard. Ken is singularly responsible for holding this idea of constitutional recognition over those long nine years of conservative rule. And there was every chance that we would lose the thread of continuity, but we didn't. We kept alive the agenda of constitutional recognition and Ken was in the most excruciating position of all of us, having to maintain this opportunity from the hardest place possible. So I really appreciate that the opportunity that we're now 400 metres away from reaching We're in this position because of Ken's work under the previous government. The only political thing that broke the bipartisanship, in my view, was the election of Labor. Essentially, what Linda Burney and Anthony Albanese have done is picked up a ball that Ken and others had nurtured over a long period of time. This should have been done by the Conservatives. It would have been easier on the country had it done so. The only thing, the only sin committed by Labor was that they won power. And having waited so long um, for this moment to come, I obviously am delighted that we're now within reach of the goal that we've had really for 15 years. Okay, before I get to the details of the provision, I want to tell the larger story here. I think we're going to create a new story for Australia after October the 14th. The story that we've had from the beginning and that has prevailed for over two centuries is the story of settlers and natives. Settlers that believed this continent was legally unowned. 
That's the meaning of terra nullius. They understood there were people here, but the belief was that the people held no rights to the land. And the country clung to that settler idea for 204 years. It was not until our High Court had the opportunity to own up to the truth. The country was not terra nullius. The peoples in occupation of the country were human beings who had become British subjects upon annexation and were now entitled under the common law to their homelands. That was the truth. It was not just a truth of history, it was the truth of the common law. Inherited from England, according to the theory, brought to Australia on the shoulders of the colonists, falling upon the land to become the law of Australia. So the big, great advance that was made in that relationship between the settlers and the natives was Mabo. But the story of settlers and natives is still our lingering story. The settlers are the main actors. They are the owners of Australia. And the natives are somehow out of sight, out of mind, on the margins of their own land. Not recognised. When the country was pulled together as a nation in 1901 with Federation, there was no recognition of the natives. It is the lacuna that we're trying to fix with this referendum. To fix that which was omitted 120 years ago. And when we do that with this referendum, I think we'll have a new story. I think and I hope that the settler versus native story will fall away to history. We'll have a new story. And that new story will be about Australia's indigenous story. Going back 60 millennia, representing the foundations of our nation and encompassing all of the glorious languages and cultures and heritage of those 60 millennia. That'll be the first story. The second story will be the story that started in 1788. There's no denying it. The country has institutions that have their provenance in Britain, ultimately captured in our constitution, our British democratic heritage is the second story. And the third story is the story of our multicultural immigration and the triumph that we've achieved in this country of diversity in unity. We're a marvelous beacon to the world in what we've achieved with our multiculture. Those are the three stories of Australia. That is the Australia we see in the mirror if we truly look. Settlers and natives is an old story. It ill suits our future and doesn't represent our present. 
We got three stories. Plain as the nose on our face. Indigenous foundations. British democracy. And multicultural unity. When we look ourselves in each other's eyes, that's what we'll see in the future. We'll see a place. We don't even really know what to do with our multicultural groups that didn't come from the United Kingdom. Are they settlers? They're not natives. Or are we kind of giving them a kind of strange, undetermined position in our sense of who we are? We're going to clean that up. We're going to clear that up. And we're going to really understand there's three stories intertwined in Australia. And our children will ever look at themselves as part of those three stories. Not the way we look at ourselves or that we've looked at ourselves hitherto. And I think it will be a good day when our children see a new story about who the Australian people are. And what is Australia? I have a belief that when we do that, we'll put behind us the prejudice, the rancor, the alienation between indigenous people and the rest of the country. I think prejudice will diminish after this referendum. You know why? Because I think we'll let go of some of our hang-ups. Some basic hang-ups such as, if we recognise the indigenous people, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> Are we going to be required to jump on the ships? and return to England. <laughs> I think the problems are existential. They always have been. You study history. We couldn't recognise land rights because we couldn't work out how it is if you recognise the land rights of the Aboriginal people in the 19th century, what does it mean for the rest of us? What is our footing in the country as settlers? if we recognise the truth that English law accords possession to people who are in occupation. So we put off land rights for 204 years. Okay, I just have a great belief that when we understand that we're all Australians, nobody's going away, we're all here to stay. We all have a place in the country. We have done much justice with Mabo. And no one loses a backyard, not one. <laughs> this is the provision we're voting on. It's got four parts, 92 words. And the first line is the most important in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. This is what the Australian people will do in this referendum, which is as equivalent and profound as the High Court's decision in Mabo. The High Court has done its bit now the people of Australia, by authorising this referendum, will declare today and forever that the Aboriginal and 
Torres Strait Islander people were the first peoples of Australia. The second part is the guarantee. The guarantee of the Australian people to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Not a parliamentary guarantee, not a government guarantee, but a guarantee of the Australian people that there shall be a body. Parliament can chop and change, can amend, scrap, but it always has to have a body. That's the guarantee. There shall be a body. The next aspect of the provision that we're voting on concerns the role of this body, the purpose. And the purpose is to make representations. Making representations, as Professor Toomey has explained from Sydney University, is Democracy 101. Everybody makes representations. Farmers, miners, human rights advocates, environmentalists, social welfare lobbies, individuals, even lobbyists. It helps if they got a donation in the bag. <laughs> but they all make representations to the parliament and to the government. It's just the normal democratic process. This voice will represent representations on behalf of two peoples, the Torres Strait Islanders and the Aboriginal people. And what on? Well, the words are very clear in that provision on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Their health, their welfare, their jobs, their culture, their land rights, their environmental concerns. On matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's the scope. You'd be hard pressed to find nuclear submarines in there. <laughs> all, all parking tickets. And I don't think if another siege happened in Martin Place that the voice would have to be consulted if it was an Aboriginal gunman, as Peter Credlin claimed. Okay, the final provision is the details. Where are the details? Who's hiding the details? Why aren't, why aren't people being upfront about the details? It's all answered in the last clause. The parliament shall have the power to make laws. That is the answer to the detail question. The parliament shall have the power to make laws about the composition, functions, powers and procedures of the voice. It's actually not the government. It's the parliament that is responsible for the details. Linda Burney and Anthony Albanese may have a model in mind, but they've got to get it through the Senate. It's the parliament that decides the detail. Mr. Dutton has a role in determining the detail, as does Senator Price, as does Senator Hanson. They're all responsible for furnishing the details through the normal parliamentary process. Now, this is the case with everything. That's how our democracy and parliament works. The Constitution confers a power on the Parliament and then it's up to the Parliament to furnish the details. Taxation, one word, 4,000 pages of legislation. <laughs> the ABC, under Section 515, first promulgated in 1932 by the Parliament 
amended in 1942, scrapped in 1983, and completely replaced. That's the way our system works. Parliaments change laws. They change details from the time to time. We are not voting on the details. The details are always subject to change by the parliament. What we're voting on is the constitutional provision. And it's right there. So I urge all of you to take fellow Australians, family members, people at the train station, people on the phone. I want you to phone people. I want you to be at the railway station and the shopping centres. We've got to do this. We can't muck about. I want you to explain them this clause, these 92 words. We have got such a wonderful opportunity at hand here. We need Western Australia. We really do. You've got to treat this as three and a half, four weeks. It's the length of a normal federal election. We can win this. We need more volunteers and we need you to take responsibility for the result. Only when all of us take responsibility for the result will we really shake this tree down. Thank you. Protection under rule of law. But what of the first people, custodians of the land and sea? Voices of wisdom, silence from the start, erased from history. We all share the Constitution, the reason that we all live free is the heart. Challenges we've overcome The Constitution is a reminder Of the values that make us one We all share the Constitution The reason that we all live free Is the heart of our democracy The voice of you Let's not miss 
this opportunity to fulfill our destiny. The Constitution belongs to you and me. The reason why we all live free It's the heart of our democracy The voice of you and me We all share the Constitution The reason that we all live free It's the heart of our democracy The voice of you and me The voice of you and me. The voice of you and me. Well, thank you very much, Noel. Very um, powerful words. Um, one of the questions which I'm going to answer myself is um, the, the media, oh sorry, when will it be legislated that misleading and deceptive advertising and conduct will not be permitted in referendums or elections? Um, well, I have to say I introduced a private member's bill that would have that effect, and Zali Stegall had as well. Um, it, it won't get passed, but um, the, the government has committed to legislating truth in advertising, And, um, and recently in a discussion I had, they said it is on the table for negotiation as part of an electoral reform package. So I think this year is the time to express a, a public desire uh, to see that in legislation. Testing? Yep, it works. Hi, um, my name's Pete. Thanks so much, everybody, for the, for the, um, for the speeches. It was very uh, inspirational. Um, I work in Aboriginal health and have done for many, many years. Um, And in our region in Kalgoorlie, I'm, I'm trying to convert the no voters. Um, I'm trying to find ways to persuade them, and it's quite challenging. And Ben would probably know some of the challenges in districts like that. Where do you need volunteers to make a difference for the West Australia when it comes down to the arithmetic? Where, where, here, we're, we're, I think we're all preaching to the converted. My location um, is, is all, I think, a yes area. Where do you need us to, to, um, to volunteer to try to, to try to convince the undecideds? Well. <laughs> really everywhere, um, the, best, the best way to do it is ultimately, as Noel was saying, those one-on-one -on -one conversations um, that a lot of people are having, uh, whether it's at the train stations or whatever, because there is a lot of, well, not just misinformation, but the knowledge base around the Australian Constitution, um, uh, the history of Aboriginal people, the history of the Constitution. I think a lot of Australians seem to think we have a Constitution very similar to the American. Um, And so you, once you actually explain that to people and the history, as Noel said, that actually the Constitution was an exclusionary document because you've got to deal with that issue of why should we have a division in our Constitution. Um, people just don't have that understanding of history. So it doesn't take long, but Western Australia, um, it, it's, it's a marginal seat campaign here is the, is the reality now. So um, anyone and everyone um, needs to be spoken to. Can I add to that too? Um, it, it, there are a lot of people who are still undecided and still don't know about it, which always surprises me. Um, so I would say don't spend too much time with the hard nose. Really look at having conversations with people who are undecided or haven't even thought about it yet. Um, in, the, in the door knocking that we're doing, we're getting roughly 40% yes, 20% hard no and, and 40% Does that, does that add up? Yeah. 40%, 20, and 40% und, uh, undecided. Now, some of those undecideds will be no's because it's much harder to say no to someone wearing a yes T-shirt standing on your front veranda. Um, but there are a number of people who still say, what's it all about? I haven't heard of it. Um, or I've seen, I've seen lots of noise in the media, but I don't understand. So I think that is where it's worth investing the effort. Um, a lot of younger people support it but don't see what the big deal is and so are not really um, engaged on it. Um, the, the attitude that we see seems to be, yes, yeah, seems fine, but why are we still talking about it? Can't we just get on with it? 
Um, but but those, it's those you know middle-aged um, people who haven't heard about it yet. Geographically, I think there's a, a really good mix. So wherever you are, speak to your community. Can I add that if you're campaigning in regional Australia, one thing every regional area believes is they never listen to. And if you say to a hard person in Kalgoorlie, for example, how difficult it is for us to be heard in Perth and Canberra, think of what it's like for the blackfellas. Yeah. That's the argument I'd use. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. We've got a question up here. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, and uh, I did enjoy listening. I'm yet to be converted, so can I just read this question sitting down because I need a, a light? Janet Albertson, lawyer and journalist, has written a number of well-reasoned articles for The Australian regarding the power that the voice would have if established in the Constitution. No one from the yes side seems willing to debate the points that she makes, especially about the danger to government by the voice demanding rights that would be given to it under Section 75.5 of the Constitution. My question to the panel is, how and why is she wrong in this assessment? Uh, what? Can you can you repeat that? I missed the middle bit about the last mining bit. rights, was it? No, no. This is the. She makes the point that um, there is a great danger to government that the making of representations will clog up the power of government because it stops it from being able to do anything without it going to the high court if they don't listen in an effective way, and and I want to know why she's wrong. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> OK. Well, government and parliament are receiving thousands of representations. A democracy is a competitive place. Everybody's trying to get in front of ministers, trying to get in front of parliamentarians. And parliamentarians' only obligation is to listen, not heed. And nothing uh, on the part of the voice can slow down the processes of parliament. Nothing is justiciable, actually. This is... Um, a couple of people might have a go at trying to, as they do with any aspect of the Constitution, um, but this is about as inert as it gets. Um, the, these words here um, were really the subject of advice from former Chief Justice French and another Chief Justice and High Court judges. This is the aim of the whole design of this provision was injusticiability. The provision needed to be injusticiable. And uh, in any case, prior to the adoption of the words by the Parliament, the Prime Minister negotiated an amendment. Is, can we put that last clause up? An amendment to the, the provision that made it very clear that everything about the voice is subject to regulation by the Parliament. Uh, everything. I, I would also add, reading um, the article by Robert French, the ex-Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia on this, I think is a very good uh, answer to Janet Albrechtson, uh, Albrechtson's argument. And I certainly would take the ex-Chief Justice of the High Court's view, um, you know, because I think it comes from a position of, of, um, of knowledge. Okay, so I can, think there are responses. Yeah. Can I just add, I, I, re I referenced, I guess, the best example, the live example here in Western Australia, where we've had, um, uh, since 1972, a voice whose role it is specifically to advise the authority, the government, uh, on issues relating to Aboriginal affairs. What, in practice, that has become is the actual body kind of narrows down on what it actually advises on, because ultimately it wants to be influential in particular areas, so it picks particular policy areas, and it's never been used in a court. It's never been used as a sword to... To, to challenge a decision of government simply because, as Noel's saying, it doesn't have the capacity to be used that way um, to challenge a decision of, of the government of the day because it's only advisory in nature. And that's been in place since 72. 
Uh, I'm a Yes23 volunteer. I'm frequently asked, there are already a number of programs out there delivering beneficial outcomes. What will the voice do that's better? Let me give a, a quite practical reason why uh, I support the voice. Government actions over the last 15 years and more have really decimated remote communities in Australia. They've been treated shamefully, in my view, cruelly and despotically. I've taken messages from remote communities to Canberra, and I can tell you the bureaucracy is unseeing and unhearing. They seem to know best. They are deaf and blind. And that's why a message in the Constitution that affirms what all governments agreed in 2020, in 2020, that you should listen before you act, is absolutely essential. It's a practical matter. 100,000 or so Aboriginal people live in remote communities. They're the most put upon Australians under so many circumstances. And I find it absolutely disgraceful, and I think they deserve a voice. And in the design of this, this that's been developed by Karma and uh, Langton. Langton, they specifically say there's a need for those areas to be represented. The remotes are close to my heart because I think they are the most put upon, punished, and ill treated Australians. I'm actually not old enough to vote yet, but uh, yeah. Um, how are you getting all this stuff across to my generation? If I look at my 15-year-old um, TikTok, I guess it's there. No, I'm, I'm sort of not. That's where she gets a lot of her information. She gets a lot of no information on TikTok. Um, but there's, there's actually been pretty good social media campaigns um, on, on both sides, actually. Uh, so sort of picking through that information. But there are so many different websites now. Um, the Yes campaign's got a great one. A lot of the universities have very good uh, uh, websites that give you a lot of information around um, why you should vote yes, because of the 700 and nearly 800 organisations that have declared a position, they're all yes. Um, so there, there are, there's plenty of opportunities to find the information. Yeah, I guess my question would be is just what's a better way to talk to young people other than just screenshotting information and talking to them and just basically trying to explain that this isn't some power grab that is actually extremely important for us as we get older, because I'm hoping I've got like another like 60 years left, so yeah. I would say maybe you can tell us what the better way to, to do that is. <laughs> uh, I think it's fantastic that you're having those conversations and I think you know we all need to talk to our parents, our children and, and everyone around us. Um, social media seems to be the way to communicate uh, you know, with younger people um, and making those messages uh, as simple as possible. Um, but, but I think a lot does turn on those personal conversations, so that's, that's a really important part of the campaign. Uh, we have a teacher here who said understanding the timeline uh, of Australian history is a really useful tool in, in speaking to young people, and, and that's a, a good point which I'll take on. Yes. I'd just like to ask if uh, you have any idea why there's so much nastiness and negativity coming from the no side of the campaign. I'd just like to say that to answer that would simply cause the next furore <laughs> and would say we were being nasty. So I only put it down to the fact that they are unfortunately not understanding what a simple, generous proposition this is of such profound, practical impact. And we can only pray that God will guide them in a better light. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, quite choky. 
I've got a question about how the voice will affect. I read an, I read an article on the Guardian about Aboriginal um, illiteracy, and I would like to know how the voice would have an effect on that. Oh, you know, the voice is going to have to come up with new solutions, innovation, new ways of tackling problems. We've tried a lot of things. Many of them haven't worked. and They're not producing the results we want. We're going to have to really put our thinking hats on about ideas that community members have. There is a lot of innovation going on across different parts of Indigenous Australia. Um, some of those things are really good. They're just not big enough. So we've got to bring them to scale. And, um, and also, good things that are happening in the Kimberley, we would like to reproduce in Cape York. So share success and breakthrough ideas. So literacy, obviously, you know, education. I've said also, not all of these challenges that we face are just indigenous. Our kids attend schools attended by other Australian kids. If we're going to fix up the school for, for their indigenous kids, we're going to have to fix it up for everybody. And so, lit <laughs> so literacy is one of those issues, I think, you know, that we've got to get it right for all kids. Um, so yes, a lot of work. Um, I think the voice will be very useful in a two-way conversation with government about new ideas to tackle these problems. I just want to quickly add, it won't magically fix everything overnight. These are really hard problems and we don't know the solutions to them, but we're far more likely to find the solutions if they're developed with the people who are affected by those policies. Just, uh, I'd just like to ask, Ken, when you were speaking at the beginning and you mentioned about the amount of consultation that's gone over many years, I've had a couple of calls with my campaigning with people in uh, regional areas, Aboriginal people, saying, my mob don't know about this voice business. They don't know what it means. And it's been reported in, in, um, in the media as well. A comment about that? On the consultation I was talking about, all parliamentary committees, when they traverse this nation, identify uh, key areas that they work through. Now, the smaller communities have to come into larger centres, and that does create a problem in the consultation process. But we also used Indigenous media. And let me say the parallel during COVID-19 was that we reached every Aboriginal community using media and using Aboriginal organisations. And communities locked down and locked out people so that they did not become exposed to COVID. Now, there are individuals who may not have attended meetings, and I've had a couple recently talk to me about this, but every... And I'm not sure how many of you covered, Noel, when you did the referendum council, but you reached to just about every corner of Australia as all of the parliamentary committees did. What may not be going out clearly is what the voice looks like based on the discussions that are occurring in the last six months. Because let me tell you, uh, all those parliamentary inquiries were extensive. The expert panel went to the four corners of this country to talk to every organisation, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. We took submissions, we had copious lists of letters from people and discussions occurred. So I suspect your question is about the detail that they believe is not there because they're hearing, show us the detail, when in fact the information about what the voice is, is out there. Legislation still has to be developed and discussed in the federal parliament. 
And let me say on legislation, there is not one person in this room who gets the chance to look at the legislation that is introduced into a house in any parliament, state or federal, until the minister tables it and they do the second reading. That's when we get to know about it. And it's the same as this. It'll be known to all of us when the legislation is tabled for the second reading. The first reading is the announcement of it. The second reading is the introduction of the bill. We have time for one more question. Oh, hello. Um, good evening. My name is Judith, and thank you very much all for coming. I've been very illumined. Um, I've been sitting on the fence a bit. My heart says yes, and my head says no, and then I go backwards and forwards and read everything in the Australian. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and, and read it on the internet as well. But um, my, my question is really what concerns me most, and that is I'd love to hear from anyone on the panel who can address the underlying issue which I see as being the healing of intergenerational trauma and the associated breakdown of families because it seems to me this is really foundational to the whole problem, you know, about incarceration, about assaults, about domestic violence and everything else. So I'd just be encouraged to hear how this might be a way forward in that area. Thank you. Actually, I'll start. My mother was a member of the Stolen Generation. Her brothers and sisters were all taken away from their parents and put into different missions. They never came back and saw each other as brothers and sisters until they were in their 20s. Their initial family were the kids at the mission. And so they had two families for a long time in their lives. And then they had to grapple with establishing relationships with each other. And in some cases it doesn't occur because their names were changed. The Kinchler boys in New South Wales were never allowed to use their first or last names. They were given a number. They could only call each other by the number 24 when I first met them. And all of them are traumatised from what happened to them in Kinchler Boys' Home. And one of them explained to me that he's never lost the scars. He's found it very hard to be affectionate to his children and to his grandchildren because he was never allowed to hug or hold or express emotion. That's the intergenerational trauma that they lived through. And the levels of violence that we see referred to in terms of violence against women, governments have had the capacity to intervene, but have not. I have seen Aboriginal women's groups come to the parliament wanting to meet with the minister responsible for women, but have not met with the minister. They have met with a senior advisor. The national strategy did not include Indigenous people until we fought for it. And their frustration was seeing their voices not being heard about breaking the cycles of violence. And the children see that violence, and young males in particular, think it's normal. That's what we have to break. That's why we want to be heard. That's why we want our feet under the table. And that's why we want to co-design, co-plan and co-implement and co-commit to breaking those cycles. You've all seen the words. They're in plain English. They're really understandable. They basically mean what you think they mean. And yet, there's controversy. People create controversies and conspiracies about this phrase and that wording and so on. Jesus would have a struggle <laughs> putting certain words into the Bible today. 
Blessed are the meek. Got a problem with blessed. <laughs> Why are they getting an unfair advantage? <laughs> what about the rest of us? And, and what's this blessed anyway? And the meek, they might look meek, but... <laughs> and then the clincher comes with, shall inherit the earth. <laughs> there's the backyards, there's the beaches, there's the national parks, all revealed. He couldn't get it up, I bet you. I think that's a good note to finish on, don't you? Thank you very much for um, coming tonight and thank you to, to our panel and please join me in giving them a round of applause. If you are a no um, voter or an undecided, thank you very much for coming tonight and listening and I hope you've got something to think about. If you are a yes voter leaving here today, um, then I ask something of you. Firstly, I ask you to get involved. Um, now, a big part of this is giving permission to other people to vote yes, and there are different ways that you can do that. Um, have conversations with people that you know and love, because they're more likely to listen to you than they are to listen to a stranger. Um, volunteer. You can sign up for Curtain for Yes or many of the other Yes campaign groups that are in Western Australia. Wear a badge, wear a T-shirt, put a sticker on your car. All of these things provide social proof and show people that there are a lot of supporters out there. So don't underestimate your ability to influence those around you. Um, join the campaign. It is a really positive thing to be involved in. And if you think this matters, it feels so much better to be doing something about it than sitting back and wringing your hands. Um, come and join us. You can sit and drink coffee with other uh, voice supporters. You can wave a sign or you can come door knocking. Uh, we have one door knocker, John Guilfoyle, who I don't know if, if he's here tonight, but he has uh, single-handedly door knocked his entire suburb of Daglish. Um, it's, it's possible and he's really upbeat about it. One of the real joys that I've found in this campaign is the unlikely allies that you meet. Um, you have the former Libs teaming up with the alleged communists. You've got the companies and the unions on board. You've got competing churches, competing sporting teams. 780 organisations have signed up to support the Yes campaign. And it is really, really um, positive to be involved in something that, that creates that, that sense of unity. Um, I also want to say that, no, and so if you want to sign up and be part of the campaign, uh, you can sign up outside in the foyer tonight or uh, on the Yes 23 website. Uh, my group's Curtain for Yes, but there are lots of others that you can get involved in as well. Um, to everyone, no matter how you're voting, I have one last thing to ask of you uh, before you leave. Be respectful and curious in your conversations. Uh, this isn't a football match with a winner and a loser. Um, this is about how we see ourselves as a country. And no matter what happens on the 14th of October, we will need to move forward together uh, with hope. So um, keep that in mind, that in all the conversations that you have, try to find the thing that you have in common with someone. Uh, be curious about why someone feels a certain way uh, and build on what you have in common because uh, we don't need to go down the polarised path that we're being uh, led down. So just really try and um, make this a positive experience. This is a choice between hope and fear and we have the opportunity to choose hope. Thank you for coming tonight.